Now, even though slavery has existed all over the place, slavery as it developed in the Western Hemisphere was quite different from the institution as it had existed in other places and times. Um, generally speaking, before this, slavery was what we call household slavery. That is, slaves were um, uh, debtors or criminals or people captured in war, um, and they worked in small units. They maybe work on a farm or in a household. Um, it was slavery, in other words, in most places before the Western Hemisphere was a fairly minor part of society. It was not the foundation of the economic order. Um, and as a result of that, uh, access to freedom tended to be much easier than it would become in the Western Hemisphere. It was hardly uncommon in the Roman Empire for slaves to become free and sometimes become even political leaders. In Africa, slaves could become free by marrying a free, into a free family. Uh, that sort of, I'm not trying to, uh, slavery is horrible wherever it is. I'm not trying to say that was good. But in the Western Hemisphere, and I'm talking about the United States, the Caribbean, the West Indies, and particularly Brazil, the great center of slavery in South America, um, slavery differed in two fundamental ways from what had existed before. One, it was racial slavery, right? There was a, fun there was a difference of appearance between the owner and the slave which came to be described as race. That is to say, it came to be described as something inherent in the person. Skin color, is, there are all sorts of skin colors around. I mean, what's the big deal? But um, skin color came to be associated with the idea of race as an inherent quality which doomed some people to perpetual slavery. Um, in, there was no racial difference. I mean, slaves are always, almost always outsiders. They're captives. They are brought from one place to another. But that doesn't mean they're defined as a separate race. In the Roman Empire, all sorts of people could be. There was no physical difference between owner and slave. And same in Africa. The slave and the owner look pretty much the same in African slavery, but not in the Western Hemisphere. And that um, has tremendous implications for when slavery ends, because the slave, or the freed slave, that is, carries on his person or her person the mark of slavery, right? In that even though they become free, they are still seen as somehow alien uh, to the society. They're visibly that way, which was not the case in all previous slave systems. Secondly, slavery in the Western Hemisphere was plantation slavery, not household slavery. There was all sorts of slavery, and there was plenty of household slavery, and slaves did all sorts of works, but the center of gravity of slavery was the slave plantation. The slave plantation is a large-scale agricultural operation using large numbers of unfree laborers to produce a staple crop for the world market, whether it's sugar, tobacco, cotton later on. Um, what, therefore, what? What implications flow from that? First of all, there is a sharp separation between the owner and the slaves. Um, there is this constant um, immersion in the world marketplace, which wasn't the case for slavery before this. It means that the number of slaves outnumbers the free people. That when you put large numbers of people together on an agricultural uh, enterprise with a few free people and maybe dozens or hundreds of slaves, that means that the the sort of policing system or the danger or the, you know, the, 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 the need to discipline that population is far, far greater than when the slave is just a sort of one person or two working in a household. Um, and so it's a, you need a, dis a regimented, disciplined labor force with all sorts of police restrictions on them to make sure they don't conspire and rebel or run away or something like that. Um, now, why bring people from Africa 3,000 miles in order to do this? There was a lot of people already here when the Europeans came, Native Americans all over the place, right? There were millions of them. No one knows exactly how many, Mo not that many in the 
area that would become the United States, but maybe a couple of million or so, and certainly in Latin America. But it's very, <coughs> excuse me, it's very hard to enslave people on their own turf, so to speak, on their own territory. That is a recipe for constant warfare, right? Constant warfare if you're trying to enslave the people who are living all nearby. Um, also, they know the territory, they know the terrain, they can run away very easily, they have allies around. Now, there were efforts to enslave Native Americans, and in some places they worked for a while, and a slave trade in Native Americans developed in the early colonial period. South Carolina was sending Native Americans as slaves down to uh, uh, the Caribbean at some points. Oh, but also, Native Americans lacked resistance to the diseases that came along with Europeans, and they died out in enormous numbers. One of the greatest population catastrophe in world history was the decimation of the Native American population. I'm talking about the whole hemisphere, not just what becomes the U.S. And so Africans, unfortunately for them, had a greater history of contact with Europeans and greater resistance to many of the diseases that uh, flourished in the tropical world. So by the 16th century, um, as one historian writes, the color of slaves changed from white to black. Th that's an interesting sentence, because we are so used here to thinking of slaves as black. But before then, in the, European, in the Mediterranean, they were white. They were, they, they were Slavic people, Eastern European people. Now the color of slaves changed from white to black, and there was a growing tendency to treat slaves in the mass as impersonal items of commerce, rather than individuals who worked a farm or for a family or as a domestic servant. A slave trade had existed in Africa before the coming of Europeans. The European powers, as they came down the west coast of Africa, plugged into this slave trade, tremendously increased it, and reoriented it from the interior of Africa to transporting across the Western Hemisphere. And um, here are a couple of maps of the slave trade, the trade in human beings, uh, over, the, you know, over centuries. And you, the, the, at the top is the beginning, the 16th century, very, very little. 17th century, it grows mostly to, Central, uh, to the Caribbean and South America. The great height of it is the 18th century, where massive numbers of slaves are brought to Brazil, the Caribbean, and a small number, really only a small number, to British North America. And then the slave trade continues well into the 19th century, to particularly Brazil and Cuba are, are picking up slaves then. Um, and uh, I'm not going to really go into the Middle Passage, but probably many of you have seen this famous image of the slave ship Brooks and the way people were crammed in. You know, this just shows you how slaves were as commerce, as commodities, were crammed into the hold of the ship. Every spare inch was filled with a man or a woman or a child because the, the, the profit in bringing African people across the ocean to the New World was so great that even, even though many people died on the slave trade, it still was more profitable to cram them in than to uh, actually try to create a more healthy um, living situation. So again, you can look at these things on courseworks. It has a cross-section of the ship, the way people are, are, are crammed in, etc. And finally, this is just a nice picture I like. Um, slavery was everywhere in the Western Hemisphere. This is a little painting from Lima, Peru. Lima, Peru. Two, a woman going to church followed by her two female slaves. And you can find images like that all over the Western Hemisphere.